أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أستغفر الله ربي وأتوب إليه الحمد لله غير مقنوت من رحمتي ولا مقلوب من نعمتي ولا ما يوسم من مغفرتي ولا مستنكف من عبادتي الذي لا تبرخ منه رحمة ولا تفقد له نعمة وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ حديتنا وحب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سلوات لا صل على إمام الإسلام حسد Praise belongs to Allah, for no one despairs in his mercy. No one is devoid of his blessing. Uh, no one is hopeless from his forgiveness. And nobody is too proud to worship him. Mercy doesn't cease from him, and blessings are not deprived from him. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, my dear brothers and sisters. Inshallah, nice to see you all again. Um, I've been converted to bubble tea, just to let you know. So I uh, can blame certain brothers for that. Uh, but yeah, so anyway, I'm getting used to some Boston what specialities and commonalities, inshallah. Uh, inshallah, if Allah wills, next time I come, maybe I'll bring, the, bring some UK sort of things. But I've met some British people, so I'm feeling even happier than yesterday. I met some guy from Yorkshire, mashallah. I know Yasir, so alhamdulillah. Um, it's good that we are keeping up the attendance and engagement, and mashallah, yesterday there were more questions from brothers and sisters. So as um, Irtiza said, you know, whatever small I can help with, okay, I will do my best, inshallah, in the time that I'm here. Um, in fact, this coincides with what was said yesterday. We had a discussion in the evening or at night where people were asking questions about salah, meaning of salah, how to find a connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last three lectures actually leads to this lecture because I have been discussing how we must focus on our existence. We must try not to be like the Kufan people that saw the face of Hussein alayhi salam, that prayed and recited Quran, but in the end it seemed they missed the basic values meanings and contemplations of the Qur'an, the basic message of Qur'an, Amr al-Ma'roof and Nahi an al-Munkar. And yesterday, we discussed the pitfalls of disbelief and ignorance. And the question that I want to pose to you today is a very simple one. We have been given resources within our religion. In fact, any religious believer, alaykum salam, has been given resources. What are these resources? Rituals. We have salah, we have siyam, fasting, we have zakat, we have dua, we have hajj. Now if we have all of these things, shouldn't we be the most spiritual people? Shouldn't we be, be the most moral people? I mean, we pray five times a day. We fast 29 to 30 days a year. We do these long a'mal, we have dua kumail on Thursdays. So anybody from the outside should say, wow, we guys are very lucky. Muslims, you should be the most spiritual people, the most moral people on earth. So then the question is, why aren't we? Or why do people keep on saying, but I don't find any connection in my salah? Or I go back to my bad habits after hajj and ziyarat? Clearly, it, appeal, it appears to me there is a disconnect between our ibadat, our acts of worship, and what they should mean to us. And there was a disconnect in Karbala, because the Kufan people did do these things, but it appears failed to understand any type of meaning that these rituals were giving them. And in this lecture, I want to try to close this gap. I want to try to answer, if possible, how these rituals should give us meaning, okay? And in three parts I will do it. One is what we should focus on. Two is the role of reason or contemplation in Islam. And three, the actual structure of our ibadat. Now, when we pray, 
okay, or when we fast, there is a very basic question. What should we actually think about, right? I mean, should I blank out everything? Should I try to understand Allah? Should I uh, focus on my bad deeds? Should I feel happy that I'm praying? What should I actually focus on? Ibn Farid, one of the great mystics uh, or scholars of mysticism, says in defining the mawdu al-irfan, he says three very important things. He says that the subject of irfan, the subject of mysticism or in lay terms, spirituality, is three things. One is to understand the dhatullah, the essence or the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who is God? Who is he? And in fact, this is a statement of Imam Ali Islam in Najib Alaga. Awwaluddin ma'arifatuhu. The first in religion or the foremost in religion is knowledge of him. Not the one who prays and fasts. Which means even before our rituals, we have to start to think, who is this Allah? Why am I created? What is God's nature? Who is he? But after that, after posing this question to ourselves, he says that we must focus on his asma and his sifat, the names and attributes of Allah. So the names that we have been discussing, wadud, love, halim, that he is forbearing, that he is adil, he is just, he is alim, he is knowledgeable. To actually go through the names of Allah. Now, we have often been told that there are 99 names of Allah. Strictly that is not true. Because it all depends where you get your names from. They are in Quran, they are in du'as. They can be 100, they can be 140, 150. Dua Joshin al-Kabir has other names and other phrases of Allah. So it all depends how you describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now give or take 100 names, let us say. Our task in our life is to go through the Quran and, and for example, Dua Kumail, we say, Ya Nuru, Ya Quddus, for example, O Light, O Holy. And our task is to understand these names and how they manifest in the universe. That is the last aspect of Irfan, the Madahir. How Allah manifests himself in the universe. And let me just give you some simple examples of how this nature and names manifest themselves in the universe. The love that I have, let's say, for my wife and children and parents and family, or according to my wife, I still have to love her more. This is a thing which you women want, and I still don't understand how to do it. So married people will understand that. Men, do you agree with me? Women, do you? Are you going to kill me? All right. Okay. Anyway, this is a normal thing. So loving more, okay? Now, when I love, when I love, or I have a feeling of love, according to our Urafa, that is a manifestation of Allah's love in the universe. His name is Wadud. So the love that I have, or love that a human being has, is directly from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or a manifestation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our willingness to feel justice is a manif manifestation of the attribute of Allah being Adil. When we are patient, it's a manifestation of Allah being Sabur. When, when there is beauty, beauty in this gathering, beauty in the heavens and the earth, beauty we see in nature, that is because Allah's name is Jamil. So everywhere, there is a place where Allah has manifested himself. Inside us, between us, and outside of us, okay? To the extent, and this is just to give you an insight of how our beloved prophets behaved. It is reported from Sheikh Saduq, actually, that our beloved prophet, when he used to see good things happen, he used to say, Alhamdulillah alladhi bi ni'matihi tatimma salihat. He used to say, praise belongs to Allah, who by his blessing has completed good actions or good deeds. So when the Prophet used to walk on the streets and used to play with the children or see somebody give gifts, see somebody help the orphans, he used to say this statement. Praise be belongs to Allah 
who by his blessing has completed good actions. Now imagine this. When the prophet is just observing human behavior, what does he see? He sees the presence of Allah in every action. Can you imagine that? That means I see you, you see me, but with the prophet's lens, all he sees is the presence of Allah in this gathering completing the good action. This is how connected he was with Allah and how he saw the manifestation of God's presence and God's will and God's acts in the universe. Right? This is just an example of how Allah manifests himself in the universe through our feelings, through how we look at the universe, and through our actions. Now, this is one lens I'm giving you. There may be other lenses, but this is one lens that I am giving you of how when we pray, when we fast, when we give in zakat, this is how we should feel and what we should focus on. Who is God? What are his names? What are his attributes? How are they connected to me in that instant? And we all know we get distractions in prayer. We get distracted, okay? Molanas get distracted, okay? Everybody gets distracted. Nobody's different here. I'm not better than you, you're not better than me. Well, you may be better than me if you focus on your salah more than me, right? But in order to remove these distractions, I'm trying to give some practical solution here through Irfan. This is what we should focus on. In that instant, how do I feel? Do I feel sinful? Then I should think about Allah's name, Ghafoor. Do I feel happy? I'm praying. I think of Jamil, he's beautiful. Do I think of the love I have in my life? I think of Wadud. Inshallah, this is one maybe practical solution of how we can remove some distraction in our salah, salawat. Salah. The approach we should have in our ibadat and our rituals so that these rituals don't become meaningless activities. But there's a second aspect of rituals. Just because we pray and we fast and we complete all the salah and we complete our, our fasting does not necessarily guarantee us Jannah. Okay? Now, there is an understanding that we have, which we tell each other, well, if I pray and fulfill all my things, I deserve Jannah. If I'm a Shia, I deserve Jannah. If I'm a Muslim, I deserve Jannah. If I'm a Christian or Jew, I deserve Jannah. And what I'm saying to you is actually stated in the Quran. There seems to be some issue that religious believers have. And it is there, I'm going to recite you the verses as proof, that just because we are born into a faith, we seem to say that we have some entitlement of heaven. There seems to be this problem <laughs> that every one of us has. And Allah talks about this problem and why we have this problem, right? In Surah Al-Baqarah, verses 111 to 113, Allah talks about this. He says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَقَالُوا لَنْ يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةِ إِلَّا مَنْ كَانَ خُودًا أَوْ نَصَارًا تِلْكَ أَمَانِيُّهُمْ قُلْ هَاتُ بُرْحَانُكُمْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ And they say, no one shall enter paradise except one who is a Jew or a Christian. And I say the same thing for a Muslim. Okay? Those are their false hopes, Allah says. They have, they're just falsely hoping. They think they are entitled to heaven because they are part of a religious group. Be a Jew, be a Christian, or today let's say Muslim. But what does Allah say, or he tells the Prophet to say? Say, produce your evidence, burhan, should you be truthful. Now this is a very key verse. Because what Allah is saying is, so what if you are born into religion? Bring your justification as to why you deserve heaven, why you believe that just because you are part of a religious group, prove to me. Why you deserve this entitlement? Is it because of your actions? Is it because of your intentions? Is it because of the way you have treated human beings? Bring me your evidence that you have followed the scripture correctly. That is what Allah is saying. And he continues. And he provides the criteria. He says, Certainly whoever submits his will to Allah and, to Allah and, is, and is virtuous... He shall have his reward near his Lord, and they shall have no fear 
nor they shall grieve. So now Allah puts two criteria here. Criteria. It says, submitting to the will of Allah and being virtuous, which in simplified terms is what we say in Surah Al-Asr. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Indeed, those who believe and perform righteous actions. So, I might submit to God. I might say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. But there's another qualification that I've got to do, which is amalus salih, which is righteous deeds, being virtuous. The, you can't have one without the other. And people seem to think they can have one without the other. They often say, and I've heard this even since growing up, please correct me, they say, okay, I've, I've committed bad deeds, but because I am Shia, right, because the Ahlul Bayt will intercede with me, I'll be fine. Because I am a Christian, Jesus will save me. Okay? Because I am a Jew, I am entitled and I am, part, and I am going to go to the promised land. Okay, where did these entitlements come from? What about our bad actions? What about the way we treated people? Doesn't this count for anything? A person that does not have any religion but may be searching for the truth and, but commits good, good actions... He may be more entitled than me. In fact, as a side point, if you read the tafsir of Ihdin as Surat al Mustaqim, guide us on the straight path. If you read the tafsir of that verse and how it has changed from our Shia scholars, you'll be quite amazed. From tafsir al Qummi to Alama Tabrisi to Alama Tabataba, you'll see a change. In fact, originally, that verse was only meant to be for Shias, according to Tafsir al-Qummi. غَيْرِ الْمَغْضُوبِ عَلَيْهِمْ dalin. The Tafsir of that was originally from Tafsir al-Qummi. He said that the people who were astray were Christians and Jews. Okay? But if you fast forward to 20th century, 21st century, Allah Matabatabai doesn't say that. He says that the straight path means those people who submit to Allah and do good deeds. That is the criteria. So it is not necessarily that you are part of a religious group. It is that you submit to Allah and do good deeds. And not only that, he gives a very interesting example. He says that if people today who, uh, who decide to follow Prophet Ibrahim or uh, Prophet Isa, Jesus, or Musa, people today who are part of those scriptures... And they may not believe in our beloved prophet, but they believe in the previous prophets. And their deeds are better than the Muslims, then they are more entitled to Jannah than Muslims. Why? Because they have followed the scripture, their scripture correctly. They might follow Prophet Zakaria, but they're following the scripture correctly. So what does Allah say next? He says, the Jews say, the Christians stand on nothing, and the Christians say the Jews stand on nothing. So the Jews and Christians of those times, I'm not saying all Jews and Christians, but some Jews and Christians at that time were arguing with each other, saying, well, you don't have anything, and, and then they say, well, you don't have anything. But then what does Allah say? But you follow the same book. You're criticizing each other, though they follow the same book. So said those who had no knowledge. Words similar to what they say, Allah will judge between them on the day of resurrection concerning about that which they used to differ. The interesting thing in this verse is two things. This is why the Quran is still relevant today. Today, Shias still curse Sunnis and Sunnis curse Shias. Okay? This is reality. Jews may do the same to Christians and Christians may do the same to Jews. So religious groups are always in conflict all the time. In the UK, okay, we might have, mashallah, many Shia communities and Muslim communities, but we're not completely united. And as I've been talking to the brothers, I've visited America some, you know, sometimes, but I don't know everything about what's happening in, in the USA. But I, my observation is that it's practically the same. It's practically the same in Australia, where I was there for a few years. That we have many, many mosques, but our cultural differences take us apart. Our view or interpretation of a book and laws take us apart. And why? Because Allah says, but hold on a second, all of you are fighting with each other, but you follow the same book. Now, how does that make sense? There is Bible, there is Torah, and there is Quran. Now, isn't this verse a contradiction to what we believe in? Everybody should follow Quran. It is the last book and the authentic book. 
Well, yes, factually, this is what Muslims believe in. However, the essence of the Quran is exactly the same as the Bible and Torah and all revealed uh, scriptures. Because according to our ulama, all these books came from one heavenly book, which is Ummul Kitab or Lohun Mahfud, the mother of the book or guarded tablet. All revelations come from one source, from one source. And according to tafsir, that is the qalam or the pen of Allah. So none of these scriptures really differ in their message. They may differ in laws, they may differ in certain rituals and practices, but they do not di differ in their message. That is why even a non-religious person can appreciate finding the truth, finding Allah, finding a transcendental being, and doing good deeds. And so, if our rituals take us away from the essence of this criteria of submission to Allah and doing good deeds, then we do not understand our rituals and our rituals become a cause of division. And I'll just give you examples of myself. In the UK, where I teach, um, often I go and pray in the prayer room, right? Now when I go and pray there, it is, you know, I love my Sunni brothers, I, I predominantly pray there. But I've had experiences where, you know, they don't know that I'm a Shia, and, they, and this is a common thing which probably may have happened to you. They said, can you lead? And I keep my hands by the side, and they start to start another jamaat beside me. They, they leave the, the prayer, there's five people behind me, and I'm praying and I don't hear anything, I don't feel anything. Suddenly I see another jamaat on the, on the right-hand side. And they say, but uh, brother, uh, you are a Shia, you're a Kafir. I said, but my dear brothers, don't you know that the Malikis also put their hands by the side? It's one of your schools of thought. And they don't know it, right? And I'm not saying we as Shias are completely perfect either. We also don't like to join with Sunni brothers. We you know, like to pray Furada. This unfortunately is, is a habit sometimes that we have. So my, my, my simple point is that we are allowing certain aspects of our rituals to cause division when they are not the essential traits of prayer. They are not, okay? As long as you observe your qiyam, your, your ruku, and your sajda, even the basic surah of Surah Al-Fatiha, which is the essential of the prayer, not the second surah, the essential of the prayer, Surah Al-Fatiha, as long as you pray that and you're doing ruku and you're doing sajda, you are praying like all Muslims. Whether there are other differences, fine, it doesn't matter. So, this is where this tafsir is so relevant because it is applicable today to the way Muslims behave with each other. We can end up like religious groups of the past. That is why the Quran has to speak to us. It's not as if Quran is revealed and the work is done and we continue on with our rituals. We still have to understand why we are doing these rituals and whether they're causing division or unity. Salawat, please. So, the first two things that I've covered is what we should focus on, which is the nature and attributes of Allah, and the second is the essence behind these rituals. Now, the third thing is structuring rituals, which even when I was younger, I always had this question, always, and maybe you have had it, is if I am performing my salah, how should I pray, and what should I do after it? Right? And I used to always ask myself this question. So I'll give you a simple example. Uh, when I'm doing ruku, do I do subhanallah three times? Or subhana rabbil adhimi wa bihamdi? Do I also recite salawat? Do I put on lots of mustahab things there? Do I do a long kunut? Or do I just say shukran lillah and continue? Should I feel guilty afterwards? When I finish my salah, and uh, in the small mosque, small community that I grew up in, this was the routine, and it's probably common everywhere. You do your tasbih of uh, Bibi Fatima to Zahra. Maybe you do dua of, of Maghrib, right? Um, and then might be there might be dua hujjat, you know, of Imam Mahdi. So there is this kind of routine. Now, we're always told this is what you have to do. But if you read the ahadith, which I want to share with you from the Prophet and Ahlul Bayt, they didn't necessarily follow this routine. They did many other things and approached Salah in various ways. In fact, they approached the remembrance of Allah in different ways. They prayed the Salah, 
but based on their time, based on their needs, based on their feelings, they did different things after the Salah. So actually the answer is a very simple answer, that we have wajibat, we have obligations, but the way we approach our obligations is up to us. It depends on our level of spirituality, and I want to examine this. According to the Quran and Hadith, there is a hierarchy of spirituality. Now when we use this term spirituality, be spiritual, I mean, what does it really mean? Where do I start? Do I pray on time five times a day and that's what I should focus on? Do I do du'as? Do I do du'a kumail? Do I go out on the streets and spend three hours going around and giving food to homeless people and I come home, I'm tired, I go to sleep, but oh no, I've missed Salatul Now should I do that as well? Now you see where I'm going. You know, we become like schizophrenic. You know, you say, okay, I've got to do X, Y, Z, otherwise I'm not spiritual. How do we approach spirituality? According to Quran, there is a basic message. Afala ta'akulun, afala tafakkurun. Do you not think? Do you not reflect? Allah categorizes tafakkur, meaning pondering, contemplation, and reflection, as the foremost ibadah and as the essence of religion. Because the kuffar, the disbelievers, the mushrikeen, all the people that didn't accept prophets lacked. Contemplation, a simple example. Uh, the people that rejected prophets used to say two things. One was, they used to say, but our ancestors and our forefathers used to do these practices, so we follow them. Our ancestors used to bury female babies. Our ancestors used to worship idols. Our ancestors used to treat women like this, so we will. And what did the prophet used to say? Do you not think? Same message for us today. Whatever our forefathers did is not necessarily correct. It's not necessarily correct. Now, I love and respect uh, my elders, my parents, my community. I do, and I pray for them every day. But that does not mean that what I was taught in madrasa and how my masjid was structured was perfect. It wasn't. And I had to do a lot of things outside of mosque to understand things. Okay, so that means we can respect something, but we can also discard something when it contradicts religious values. So one is, people used to use the argument of their forefathers. The second argument they used to use, they used to say, well, actually, you the prophet, bring your arguments, bring your arguments, bring your bayinat. But when the prophet used to bring bayinat, they used to be stubborn inside. So there was an issue of arrogance and pride. And these two things stopped them from engaging in tafakkur. Tafakkur or contemplation is meant to give us a clear mind and remove our arrogance and our pride. So as I said yesterday, that if salah does not remove arrogance from us, then we have not accomplished the meaning of salah. And the ahadith continue this message. Just to read you a few from Al-Kafi and uh, Amali of Tusi and Saduq. For example, La ibadata kattafakkur. There is no worship. And this fatah at the end of ibadata means it's, a, it's a, the lam of absolute negation. There is no worship, no other category of worship like tafakkur. Tafakkur, contemplation, beats all our rituals that we are doing. Contemplation. For example, another uh, hadith. Kana aktharu ibadati ila Abu Dhar tafakkur. Most of the worship of Abu Dhar, the famous companion of the Prophet, was tafakkur. The reason Bilal, Amar ibn Yasir, Abu Dhar, and others attained their exalted status was because of reflection. Reflection. So our hadith, the Qur'an and hadith tells us that our approach to salah, our approach to fasting and zakat must be with contemplation. And let's give just a practical example. It is better to take time before the salah formulating the niyyah. You know, take a few minutes, five minutes, or even beforehand, prepare beforehand. Ten minutes before, you know that namaz time is coming. Think about why we are praying. 
Rather than going there, I'm praying Maghrib namaz, tirakat, wajib, qurbat, and this is what we teach our children. We never actually teach them the meaning of that, what it means, the qurba. We never, you know, just recite this because if you don't recite it, your namaz will be batil. Actually, it's not true because niya doesn't have to be said. Niya is from the heart. All our, our scholars, you can look at usul al-fiqh, you can look at our fiqh books. Niya does not have to be expressed. It's from the heart. So, if we can cultivate the heart before the salah, imagine when we approach the salah. We will be trembling or we will feel love or we will feel emotion. This is why Imam Sajjad, our fourth Imam, when people used to see him pray, before, before he was approaching the Salah, he was already in a state of distress or fear or love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is why this element of contemplation is important. So that is one practical lesson maybe we can use to approach our Salah. The second one, which I don't think is usually dealt with, how do we approach our mustahab actions? And we have many. We have Dua al kumail we have Amal of Ramadan, Amal of Ashura, two hours, three hours of Amal. Okay? Now, we are doing eight majalises, right? Okay. It's good that I'm not here for Ashura. <laughs> because I would do quite a short, focused Amal. <laughs> anyway, but I always make sure at least my amal, I'm not forcing you, is very concentrated. It's not going to, f and I don't complete all actions either. I don't believe in it, okay? I'll tell you why. Just to give you a historical point. If you take the amal of Ramadan, okay, if you remember this amal, on the 23rd night, what do we recite? We recite dua al-iftita and the duas, right? But then we will do the amal of the Qur'an, and we will do uh, uh, Dua Makari Mulakhlaq of the fourth Imam and Dua Tawbah fourth Imam, right? And then other Duas. Now I have, I have a very simple question for you. Did the followers of the Prophet and Imam do all of these things? What do you think? Sorry? No? Everybody 100%? No? A bro brother is saying no. Yeah? I would agree with the brother who is saying no. And it's a very simple point. It's not like rocket science. All of these du'as were transmitted in different historical time periods. Okay? So, if you were living in Imam Ali's time, you would not be reciting du'a makarim al-akhlaq. Because it never existed. Because it existed in the fourth Imam's time. Now, we have the benefit of these du'as, but it doesn't mean we put everything together and say to people, on the 23rd night, you have to do this. That's our issue. We did that. We put everything together, but that's not how the Prophet or Imam Ali approached rituals. As I have proved, they approach rituals through contemplation. So at the most, in Imam Ali's time, if the munajat of Imam Ali was there, I don't know if it was, maybe it was transmitted afterwards, in Imam Ali's time you would not be doing any of these things on the 23rd night. Maybe you would just be reflection and meditating. Maybe you would be giving uh, food to poor people. Maybe you would just be, uh, I don't know, uh, fulfilling your debts so that there would be no debts next year. Whatever a'amal you would do to cleanse your soul is an a'amal. But sitting for two, three hours where there is no transformation and people get tired is not an a'amal. And I want to prove this to you before I end. There is a beautiful hadith from Najib Alaga, hadith number 312. Imam Ali salam, has actually outlined how we should approach our wajibat and our mustahab. He says the following: "Inna lil qulubi iqbalan wa idbaran, faida akbalat, fa ahmiluha al nawafil, wa ida adbarat, faktasiru biha al faraid." Very simple hadith. He says, "Indeed, hearts, okay, hearts." Uh, advance and retreat. Hearts advance and retreat. What does that mean? That means, you know, sometimes we feel we want to worship Allah, right? Other times, we just want to relax. We want to watch some sports. We want to watch the cricket. Open pack of Doritos. Sit with our friends. How are we doing? Everything. And we want to relax. We want to get together with our friends. People want to take me out for bubble tea. Look, let's relax, okay? <laughs> right? Now, is there a problem in that? No, there's no problem because Allah created us like that. Sometimes we want to relax. Sometimes we feel, no, I want to worship Allah. This is normal. This is natural. 
Okay? So Imam Ali is very clever. He says, look, I know that sometimes your hearts want to advance to Allah, and other times you want to be relaxed. Right? Now look how beautiful Imam Ali approaches worship. And I wish he was alive today, because I think the way we would approach our rituals would be totally different. So he now says that, look, he says that when it advances, when your heart advances, so then put on it or burden it with nawafil. And nawafil may have two meanings. The nawafil prayer, like two rakats before fajr or four rakats after maghrib, the nawafil prayer. Then do extra. Or nawafil may also mean the extra mustahab or spiritual acts that people may do. You feel you want to thank Allah, okay, do two rakats of shukr. You feel you want to go out on the street and feed poor people, do it. So when you feel your heart is alive and fresh, then add on other things. But now look what he says. But when you feel that your heart is a bit lazy, feel, oh, okay, it's salah now, I have to pray, right? Or there's amal, I, do I have to do, do I, you know? When you feel that laziness, what does he say? Fak tasiru, restrict it. Restrict it to the obligatories only. That means every day we can't pray the same salah. It is better to skip out all mustahab things and just pray on time and do a very short prayer. Because the heart cannot withstand the spiritual responsibility that you may be putting on it. That is why when Ramadan comes and people are expected to do this three-hour amal, and I've timed this, after 38 minutes, people go to sleep. People go on their phones. People go outside and have a cigarette. People go and talk. And then they come back. I'm still here. I'm still here. You know? And then the father sees them. The cousin, so nobody, nobody sees where they've gone. Oh, come on, this happens everywhere. Because it is unnatural. It is absolutely unnatural for an untrained heart to do three hours of amal. It's like you telling me, can you run 10 miles now? I can't do it. I can do two miles. I can do two. Just about. But I cannot do 10 miles, right? I'm being honest with you, right? So if you tell me, if you tell my heart, my nafs, do three hours of a'mal in Ramadan, I can't do it because I'm not used to doing it every day. Now, if you are, then alhamdulillah, mashallah, and I'll give my hat off to you, take my hat off to you if you can do it. The prophets and imams did these things relatively regularly. They prayed salatul layl regularly, okay? They, they went out to feed the poor regularly. So for them, when Ramadan came, it was a natural inclination, natural inclination to do these things. For us, it may not be. So let us take Imam Ali's advice. Imam Ali is simply saying, examine the state of the heart before the ritual. And that, inshallah, may make the ritual easier, meaningful, and something that is a beautiful experience. Isn't that what we want? At the end of the day, my dua is a very simple dua, at least for myself, is I always pray to Allah, take my soul when I am in your service, when I am in your presence, either when I'm praying to you, and I'm praying to you sincerely, not hypocritically, when I'm doing a good action, Allah, take my soul then. Because if you take my soul another time, it is just pure hypocrisy. And this is, I think, what the Qur'an and Ahlul Bayt and what Imam Hussain teaches us. Inshallah, let these majalises be a state of honesty for us so that our rituals and our existence mean something. Salawat. Today, my dear brothers and sisters, we commemorate a shaheed who fulfilled his rituals meaningfully but then carried out the actions and that is none other than Habib ibn Madahir. Habib ibn Madahir was an elder and a notable from Kufa. He received the call to go to Hussein alayhi salam. We do not know how Habib ibn Madahir and Muslim ibn Aqil were able to escape or escape Kufa to try to see Imam Hussain Islam, to return to Kufa to pass messages. But on the day of Ashura, Habib ibn Madahi was able to leave Kufa and arrive in Ashura. 
But when he arrived to Imam Hussein's camp and he saw the face of Hussein as soon as he saw Hussein, he said, oh my beloved master, my body is old and I am an elder, but when I see you, I receive that energy, I receive that freshness in my heart to go out on the battlefield to defend you, to make my existence meaningful. At that moment, people were asking that who is this person? For there is a flag here and who is going to hold it? Imam Hussein could have given that flag bearer to anybody, a young person, a strong person. But do you think that strength matters? No. He gave it to Habib ibn Madahir, whose heart was alive and vigorous to defend Hussein salam. When he held the flag of Hussein, Zainab salamullahi alayha gave her salams to him. Habib received the salams of Zainab, but started crying and said, who is Habib to receive the salam of Zainab? You and I, we pray or we say that we are Shia and that when we go to Jannah, we would like to see the face of Zainab. I will tell you, my brothers and sisters, that I am embarrassed.